There is no scenario on earth in which a surge in revolving credit debt for people buying you know, uh, consumables, groceries, and everything, like, that's not good in an economy. That's ins like anyone who thinks that is good is insane. Welcome to Wealthion. I'm Wealthion founder Adam Taggart. As we enter the second half of 2023, will the stronger than expected recovery in the markets continue? Or will forces such as the lag effect of the Fed's hawkishly aggressive policies over the past year ruin the current party? For insight, it helps to talk to those tasked with captain and client capital through the seas ahead. Today, we're fortunate to hear from Michael Green, Portfolio Manager and Chief Strategist at Simplify Asset Management. Mike, thanks so much for joining us today. Oh, Adam, it's a real pleasure. Hey, it's always a pleasure to have you on the program here. Uh, as before we started the cameras here, you were telling me about your cross-country uh, travails. Uh, I'm glad they're over. Glad you're in one piece. <laughs> Looking forward to this discussion with you. Um, lots of questions for you, but let's just kick it off with the regular general one I like to start these discussions with. What's your current assessment of the global economy and financial markets? Well, I, so it's, I think it's been very clear that the global economy is slowing. I think at the end of 2022, there was a lot of discussion around the idea that perhaps the reopening of the Chinese economy economy would provide the stimulus that would keep the rest of the world going, effectively the reverse of the decoupling hypothesis or a repeat of the decoupling hypothesis from 2008. Um, unfortunately, at this point, I think that's been largely acknowledged to be a bust. The Chinese economy has not proven to be nearly as robust as people had anticipated, and the rest of the world has slowed down significantly more. Um, on the flip side, side of that, you've seen obviously equity markets in particular have been extraordinarily strong across multiple geographies, whether it ranges from Japan to the United States, uh, particularly in the technology sector, to Europe, you've seen the impact of, you know, the end of the 2022 quote unquote bear market continuing into 2023. And I think that's led to an awful lot of confusion about you know, what's really going on. It doesn't feel like it's possible that the economy is slowing down to the magnitude that we seem to be indicating, particularly in Europe, which already appears to be deeply into recession, um, and squaring that with the behavior of financial markets. I think you know, one of the things that's so fascinating is how much our ex expectations are shaped by the behavior of financial markets themselves, right? Um, and the performance of the NASDAQ in particular for 2023, I think has a lot of people scratching their heads. I, I, for me, it's a little easier because I look at financial markets and say, they themselves are derivatives of flows and behaviors. And until you see those flows and behaviors change, and you've heard me talk about this often, I don't see any reason why we should expect them to meaningfully reflect economic fundamentals. All right, so let's let's actually talk about the key flows that are going on here. Um, a theme on this program uh, a lot of late has been liquidity, yep. um, where I think folks really expected liquidity to be coming out of the system pretty substantially at this point because we had turned off the Fed's monetary stimulus and tightened interest rates and doing quantitative tightening. Uh, and um, uh, now we're refilling the TGA you know, after the debt ceiling has been raised, um, there just seems to, in, in uh, financial stimulus, um, we're not passing any more financial stimulus right now. Um, so there was a there was a sense of, of getting to a stimulus cliff this year. And a lot of the things I mentioned have, have been happening. Now, that said, there have been other things going on that have been continuing to add liquidity in here. And Net net, you know, people have different ways they measure this, which is what makes it somewhat complicated. But but net net, you know, there are some that say it's actually we've had net liquidity entering the system, and and if so, that does explain in some ways the robustness of the financial markets. Um, I guess I'd love to hear any thoughts you have on liquidity, maybe uh, get a sense for how you like to track it, and and what other flows right now do you think are are, are instrumental in explaining you know the equity markets performance so far. Yeah, I mean, the, the great thing about liquidity is, is that there's so many different definitions of what it actually means, right? And so part of the definition of liquidity can include things like the wealth effect associated with stock prices. So stock prices going up enhances liquidity, right? It increases mm -hmm. the collateral that's available, et cetera. I think, um, 
you know, when most people talk about liquidity these days, they're very focused on the central bank dynamic. And so, you know, when we look at the continued tightening of balance sheets on central banks, in particular, the quantitative tightening that's coming from the Federal Reserve. I think a lot of people have been confused by that. Obviously, you mentioned the TGA. Your audience is going to be familiar with the offsetting effect of the, of the Fed tightening its balance sheet at the same time that the Treasury was spending down its checking account that creates a unified government balance sheet that on ge in general has actually been a net provider of liquidity on a, on a year-to-date basis, right? Um, I, I think that helps to explain the behavior of financial financial markets. I don't think it's fully responsible for it, though. And I just want to emphasize that one of the key things that we're seeing in markets has been this extraordinary divergence between kind of, you know, the fabulous seven in the form of the leading stocks in the NASDAQ and much broader markets. The Russell 2000, I believe, is actually now down again for the year. Um, if I look within the Russell and I do an equal weighted Russell, it underperforms. So the majority of stocks themselves are actually flat to down on the year, even as financial markets, particularly, again, in the form of something like the NASDAQ uh, 100, the Qs, that's appreciated very sharply on a year-to-day basis, right? So we're seeing you know, what I would describe as a combination of liquidity and the term that I use for it, the economic term is inelasticity where changes in supply and demand can cause very, very significant changes in price. We often hear the idea of, you know, oil demand is inelastic. Well, another example of inelastic demand is Microsoft buying back its shares or Apple buying back its shares or Nvidia buying back its shares where it's doing, through, doing so through an accelerated share repurchase program um, where they don't care what the price is, right? They're not trying to time a bottom or anything else. And so they become a continuous force, increasing the demand for the underlying shares. That in turn can cause the stock price to rise significantly unless there's very willing sellers. And that to me feels like the much bigger story that we've seen so far in 2023, which is just generally an absence of people who are willing to bite the bullet and execute a semi-distressed sale, right? This is absolutely what we're seeing within the housing markets, for example, where the unique feature is actually not the number of new homes, for example, that are being built or bought. It's actually on the existing home sales or in the commercial real estate space where everyone is doing everything they possibly can to avoid selling, right? They're mm -hmm. holding on to their mortgage effectively as compared to their house because they recognize that if they go to sell their house in the United States, for example, you have to get rid of your mortgage as secured by the property. And a new mortgage that you enter into is going to cost you dramatically more, right? So most people are doing everything they can to avoid stepping out of that situation. So for me, it was, you know, one of the more interesting experiences. You mentioned my cross-country trip. I actually just sold a home in California. I am not buying another home. I'm doing everything I can to avoid entering into that <laughs> transaction precisely because I look at the value of the house that I just sold and I'm like, this is crazy. This house shouldn't be worth anywhere near this amount in these conditions. The carrying cost for the new owner of that home is roughly three times what mine was, right? That's an extraordinary change when you stop and think about it in terms of the implications of much higher home prices over the last five years against dramatically higher interest rates we haven't even begun to see that filter through the system yet. And that to me is what's going to be really interesting. We're starting to see it internationally. You're seeing the UK government being forced to respond to the dramatic increases in interest rates and the costs of mortgages as those mortgages reset in the UK. Canada is facing similar challenges. Those tend to create their own catalysts where suddenly the explosion, the explosion in carrying costs changes that calculus and forces people to bite the bullet. But across corporate debt, across commercial real estate, across residential real estate, we across equities for that matter, we really have not yet begun to see those implications, that distressed selling or that recognition of a much higher cap rate to use uh, econo you know, the, the real estate economic term. It just hasn't yet penetrated into the system. All right. So in, in my inter introduction to this discussion, I mentioned the lag effect as, as one potential 
uh, variable here that could come into play uh, later this year. Um, uh, it sounds like, from what you're saying, you, you expect there to be some sort of reckoning from this higher carrying cost that the economy is being forced to take on right now, right? But but right now, players are trying to resist it, right? You gave an example of, of homeowners right now where transactions have dried up basically because nobody wants to sell. They don't want to give up their affordable mortgage yet at this point in time. Yep. Um, do you see that as, as more or less... Um, you know, a, a relatively predictable development here that we're going to start seeing more and more parts of the economy crack under this higher cost of capital? Unfortunately, I think that's, I think the answer to that, of course, has to be yes. And I think the problem is, is that those lag effects are, are what contributes to the Hemingway observation, right? How did you go bankrupt slowly and then all at once, right? Um, once the first distress sales start, then the prices start to reset lower. Suddenly people are facing the reality of, well, now maybe I can't sell because I can't actually afford to, to pay off the mortgage that I now have. If that continues to carry through and it then leads to a decline in various other economic activity, which causes people to be unable to take jobs in new locations, be unable to relocate, unable to prosecute their retirement as they had originally planned their objectives, then all of a sudden behaviors really start to change meaningfully and that whole system can start to move at a much faster pace. The other component of course is, is that when you start thinking about things like commercial real estate, secondary private, you know, the private markets in credit, the private markets in equity, as public markets or as transactions begin to validate a much lower pricing environment, you start to see pressures emerge in all sorts of ways for people to recognize the losses you know, either from a tax standpoint where it can be advantageous or from a um, need to refinance, which is really what I'm looking for in the corporate sector, you know, the number of companies that are in the levered space that can actually afford to refinance at today's interest rates is remarkably low. I can send you a chart on this and I've posted some, some charts online on this and most recently in my Substack. But if I look at the high yield universe, and I split it into what companies are currently paying in terms of the coupon. So remember, they've issued the paper. While it can be trading at a distressed level in the secondary markets, reflecting the much higher interest rates, the company itself doesn't have to pay that interest rate, right? The company is paying its prior interest rate. It's very much like a home, uh, a homeowner who has you know, taken out a mortgage at a fixed rate. They pay the current costs. Um, that coupon in the high yield space and across the levered universe on average is about five and a half percent. If I use the secondary market pricing, which is the price that we're really seeing transactions occur in the secondary market. And again, because of that resistance to accept much lower prices, the transactions that we're seeing in the secondary markets are largely in higher quality credits, not the distressed credits. That number is somewhere around eight and a half percent. If I look at the, the new issue market, where either private equity sponsors are transacting in the private credit markets or um, where paper is being printed uh, um, for you know, index similar sort of transactions, the pricing is suggesting more like 12%. And if I just kind of run across those metrics, the profitability in the corporate sector, particularly for companies with leverage, just completely collapses in this environment, right? I mean, you can almost think about it in a, in a really perverse way. If you were a corporation that took out five and a half percent debt, you know, uh, three years ago, you're currently paying five and a half on your debt. Your cash balances are now actually earning five and a half percent versus the zero you were getting before. You have no incentive to put money to work. You have no incentive to make investments, et cetera. You'd almost rather just make the risk-free five and a half while you wait for, hopefully the Fed is going to pivot and cut your costs so you're not going to get hammered with this. Because candidly, you lose your equity value in almost all of these companies. You go from about 85% of the index being profitable on an operating profit basis with the current level of interest rates, the current coupons they're paying, do I get only about 7% of the universe is actually cash flow positive at the secondary market levels of interest rate? I mean, it's just an extraordinary deterioration in corporate profits that we're going to see tied to the much higher levels of interest rates. Oh, my gosh. Let me just repeat that to make sure I heard you say it correctly. Um, at, at 
the current interest rates that they're paying on the existing debt they hold, about 85% of the, the companies in the index are profitable. Um, but if they re-rate to what you're seeing as, as what new issuances are charging, um, it drops to 7% that would be profitable? Yes. yes. Wow. And sorry, which index were you looking at there? So this is this is effectively the high yield universe. Okay, the, the high yield universe. Okay, um, that is frightening. I mean, some some would call that kind of apocalyptic. Uh, and I know you're not saying they're all going to reset at the same time, right? But but that is uh, that that, that no, would I'm, be I'm really. I'm not saying terrible. that, but it is. I mean, this is the reflexivity dynamic that George Soros highlights within markets, right? I mean, so once companies start to have to reprice on that framework, or companies begin to enter in distress, and we're seeing an extraordinary increase in corporate bankruptcies. It just gets worse, right? Because suddenly the collateral is worth significantly less. I mean, I was I was laughing about. I think I actually posted this in. Uh, uh, I put out a p. I, I put out some work under Tier One Alpha as a, as, as a data service that I'm involved with, um, tied to the options market. We were highlighting the disconnect between the valuation of enterprise software companies in the public equity markets, right? So SAP is trading at a hundred times PE. And if I flip that around and I look at the private credit markets and I look at the um, current level of interest rate for um, its competitor um, variant, uh, I think it's variant, oh, Veritas, I'm sorry, um, Veritas, you know, their, their debt is pricing at 17.5%. I mean, just stop and think about that. 100 times earnings, in other words, implying a 1% cost of equity right? Roughly, I'm being very simplistic in that analysis, mm -hmm. versus a 17.5% price for first lien debt. That's insane. I mean, it literally makes no sense whatsoever. And I understand that they're different companies. I understand that they are, they're, there are intricacies around them that make that direct comparison not entirely perfect. But, you know, this is like the bread box type analogy, right? Yes, this is definitely bigger than a bread box. <laughs> All right. So, um... Uh, God, I had this whole progression where I was going to walk this conversation through, but you're kind of getting into a really interesting meat of it. So why don't we just dive right in with both hands? So um, it sounds like, yes, you, you do believe that um, sort of the cruel math uh, will catch up with the economy here. Um, what do you see as being maybe some of the, the biggest triggers or catalysts for maybe the fracture lines we're starting to see? to actually, you know, really begin to break open here? Is, is it going to take something like um, an earnings recession or something like, uh, you know, unemployment to really start rising and people start losing their jobs and that impacts consumer spending? Um, you know, what do you see as sort of the most likely triggers that could, could turn these first little, you know, snowballs into a full-fledged avalanche? Well, so the, the fun part about credit markets, and, and you know, again, I'd use air quotes around the fun part, right, is, is that they embed their own catalysts. It's called maturity and coupon payments. Um, as I mentioned, the coupon payments as they currently exist are not really the issue, right? Most companies are able to service their debt, just like most households are able to service their mortgages with very few problems. It's when that refinancing occurs, and that refinancing is always just tied to maturity, Right. So we have a maturity wall in high yield that hits around 2024, 2025. Um, heading into those sorts of events around 2024, 2025, you need to start to recognize that you don't want to be in your last year trying to refinance because then it's the equivalent of showing up and saying, you know, um, uh, I'm desperate to borrow money. What will you lend it to me at? Right. Right. Um, so you tend to, like, they should be out there refinancing this paper today. They can't because the secondary, you know, the, the primary issuance markets are so much wider than their current coupons that if they were to actually go into the markets today, they're suddenly in a position where they have to explain away why the, the deterioration in profitability shouldn't worry the debt investors, right? Um, so everybody is in this kind of frozen standstill when you ask about the catalyst, it almost always comes out of the debt markets because the debt markets have this catalyst, you know, embedded in the maturity transformation in the uh, maturity wall associated with it. So that's where I'm really looking at it. Um, the second one that you mentioned, and I think it's a super valid one, is unemployment, right? And so when people have 
jobs, particularly those who own homes, who tend to be white collar workers at the higher end of the income spectrum, that's just a reality in terms of home ownership. You know, when they start losing their jobs, then they're suddenly forced to confront the realities of, do I need to change my location? Do I need to liquefy some of my assets so that I can cover these costs? By and large, that feels to me as a second catalyst that's underway and already well underway where this, and I've, I've written about this in particular, but you know, this is a very different recession than we've seen in the past. Historically, the oversupply has been at the low end of the labor, you know, labor spectrum, right? It has been the services work, the low end services worker, it's been the manufacturing worker, it's been the construction worker who has lost their job. This time around, construction is a great example of this. I mean, this is the first cycle in US history in which we have actually built fewer homes than were occupied in the last decade. And that seems crazy when you say it until you recognize that homes are a depreciating asset. You need to replace some fraction of the existing stock every year in order to um, accommodate future growth. This time around, we actually haven't done that. This is the first time ever. So starting in Q4 2018 was the first time in US history where you could look back and say more homes were occupied than built in the last decade that's continued over the last several years has contributed to the tightness in the in the construction sector that is protecting that lower end worker. We all experience this when we try to hire a plumber or an electrician or anything else. The dynamic that's happened at the higher end is we've seen an extraordinary increase in the number of Americans, and this is a global phenomenon, that have tertiary education, college degrees, and that are competing for these jobs that are suddenly actually facing automation pressures in the form of things like chat GPT, right? Where suddenly the productivity of high-end white collar workers, whether it's tied to transportation, you and I are doing this over an electronic transportation network as compared mm -hmm. to having to travel and, and do it in person, right? The initial dynamics of that create tons of additional demand for podcast content. You and I have both benefited from those dynamics. But on the flip side of it, we just don't get on planes as much as we used to, right? So that transportation sector doesn't need the same number of workers as it might have historically. Likewise, the, the, the you know um, air traffic controllers have not expanded, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. But we're seeing higher productivity push through those. And the one area where we're really starting to see it push through is in things like the Googles, um, you know, the high-end um, marketing administrative support, the programming capabilities, et cetera, we're starting to see layoffs in those areas that we've just never seen before, right? Um, that is going to be an interesting dynamic because we just don't have good government data. The data that we track in the economy is not at all designed to track rising unemployment amongst college graduates. So we, we actually have the data I mean, the, the percentage of college graduates that are now unemployed is above 2%. Historically, that number was in the kind of 1% range, right? It's, it's up almost 100% versus its historic averages during expansionary periods. We're starting to see that data come through where things like the total wage, so if I'm using things like personal income metrics that track all wages together, we're seeing those wages fall, even as we're being told that, you know, the labor market is super strong and wages are mm -hmm. rising. Right. So, so been, yeah. Sorry, I'll, I'll let you conclude there. No, I was just going to say, so, you know, the data systems that we have that we track through the BLS, et cetera, unemployment metrics are inevitably skewed towards the traditionally cyclical aspects of the economy, but we're seeing extraordinary weakness start to come at the high end. And that's, that's just not well tracked and not well understood. And, that, and that, that's that's interesting. We've, we've had a lot of discussion on this program of late of how much can we really trust the data that's coming out from the BLS. And you're adding a piece of the puzzle here, which is, well, one of the reasons why it might not be tracking reality uh, as well this time around is because we just have a different dynamic going on here where it's it's set up to track a different type of deterioration of the workforce than we're experiencing right now. Yeah, I, so I, I don't have a lot of sympathy for people who spend a lot of time worrying about, you know, um, conspiracy at the BLS, right? Um, you know, the idea that they're goosing the numbers to make Biden look good or um, uh, to make, you know, Trump look good, depending on who's in office, et cetera. I just don't have a lot of sympathy for that because candidly, 
you know, containing conspiracies is really hard. Um, but these are genuinely hardworking, talented, smart economists who are trying to do what they have done in the past, right? They're not looking at this and saying, you know, uh, like you're just not compensated as a $75,000 a year, a hundred thousand dollar a year BLS employee to sit there and pretend to be like, well, what if this was happening in a totally different way than it's ever happened before, right? That's just so outside of your scale of activities and scope that it's unrealistic to expect it. And I think, unfortunately, I'm, I'm, I'm hugely critical of Jerome Powell, in part because I think he himself should actually be showing that imagination. He should be saying, how can we think about this? How can we explain the extraordinary divergence between consumer sentiment and what we're actually seeing in terms of the employment market? You know, the, the quick answer is, is there, that he's just not, right? The Fed is basically fighting a war that we lost 50 years ago under Volcker, to prosecute, you know, in inflation using interest rates, it just doesn't work. We're pursuing a terrible policy path that I think, you know, to go back to your earlier question, do I think the lagged effects are going to hit? I think they're going to hit and I think they're going to hit really hard and prove to be really ineffectual in, in their primary objective of containing inflation. Well, and, and one of the, the additional dangers about that is, is if the BLS numbers aren't super reflective of reality. And yet the Fed is using them as a benchmark for saying, hey, should I continue tightening here? Because, you know, Powell's essentially said, yeah, I've got these two mandates, but I'm going to prioritize taming inflation now. And so therefore, I want to see some steam come out of the job market, right? I'm trying to reduce demand a little bit. And if he's not seeing that steam come out, because the numbers are still really low, it gives him more leeway to, to be even more aggressive. And to your point, if the lag effects catch up for us, we, we may be over tightening right now and not be aware of it yet. Yeah, I mean, from my standpoint, I think there's no question about that. And unfortunately, again, the metrics that we use for things like measuring inflation, and I just think it's really important for people to understand that inflation, right, you know, capital I in, in uh, ex, you know, with an exclamation after it is a concept that with in economics means very, very different things, right? There is inflation, meaning debasement of the currency. There is inflation, meaning a change in the price level as measured by the CPI, which is a fixed basket. And so very subject to um, the emergence of supply disruptions in particular areas that are measured, right? So CPI, 40% of it is in housing. Kelter. You would be foolish to think that the impact of a shortage of construction over the last decade would not show up and manifest itself in spikes in the cost of rent, for example, right? Particularly in an environment which you hike interest rates, make it harder for people to form households in which they purchase homes. Therefore, they're forced to go hat in hand to corporate owners in the rental space, which has also experienced a dramatic change moving from mom and pop renters to an increasingly corporate market that is capable of managing its inventory in a much more efficient, and I use you know, the, the word efficient there with intentional irony, you know, manner that preserves their pricing power versus the mom and pop who traditionally be like, oh my gosh, I've got two units. If one of them's vacant, my cash flow collapses. Therefore, I'm willing to seed on price. If you're Blackstone or somebody else, you can manage that inventory much more efficiently because you've got thousands and thousands of properties, right? Tens of thousands of properties. So all of these are showing up in the measured unit that we call inflation um, and influencing the behavior of the, the, the central banks and policymakers. Again, it's, it's really asking a lot to expect a government bureaucrat to dig into the data and say, well, no, if I you know, particularly manage it in this way and I look at it slightly differently, you know, then I get totally different results. That's just not their job. Right. It's supposed to be the job of the people at the top, but I don't think they're up for the up to the task. Yeah. Yeah. It sounds like you, you, you don't have a ton of confidence in the pilot in general, but you're worried that the data on his dashboard there isn't entirely trustworthy either. Um, yes. I, I, I want to just based on something you just said, I, I want to bring up um, a tweet that I saw that you put up relatively recently uh, from your cross country trip, uh, standing there next to a statue of uh, President Truman. Um, where you say that regular readers of your work know that you you admire uh, Truman, especially for his State of the Union addresses. And you say inflation, you know, he defeated inflation with growth, not interest rate policy. And then you make this statement. 
The role of government needs to be redefined, not eliminated, or we will indeed lose our democracy. So talk to me a little bit more about that and, and how, if you were put in charge here, you would prefer that we were going against this and how we would be fighting inflation differently than the current crew. Yeah, so, I mean, just again, to help people understand and orient themselves, remember that in 1946, as the, as the troops are coming back home, one of the primary fears, you know, we've dealt with the debasement of the currency and the extraordinary increase in demand for non-productive activities like putting soldiers in the field, munitions, in, in, you know, both on the ground and in the air. You know, we've destroyed a bunch of stuff, moving us backwards. And so the supply disruptions that are not at all dissimilar to what we experienced around COVID, where we shut the world down, and then as we turn it back on, we experienced all sorts of disruptions. This is happening at that time period, but there's the additional wrinkle of, well, we have to actually address the shortages that are emerging in real time in the US economy as these soldiers come back, because if they come back and their quality of life has deteriorated radically and they go back to the Great Depression, we could very well end up facing homegrown threats in the form of communism, just like they experienced in, in you know, Eastern Europe, et cetera, right? Under, behind the Iron Curtain. And so in response to that, the US government you know, made a very clear statement of we're gonna mobilize the same resources and the same capabilities towards growth. Some of those were focused around the housing market. So we had an extraordinary growth of the housing market. People will remember things like Levittown, et cetera. We also dramatically increased our transportation capability. Admittedly, it was largely under Eisenhower and for national security reasons that we introduced the highway system in the United States. But the amount of road building, et cetera, that occurred under the Truman administration, the expansion of capabilities, and all of this was occurring against the backdrop in which we're offering the GI Bill to dramatically increase the activities and skill level in the US economy, right? That's happening, and in that context, we managed to defeat inflation the right way. We expanded supply, all right? We've made it cheaper and easier and better for people to acquire what they wanted in life, whether that was an education for their children, their own little plot, you know, quarter acre plot of land or eighth acre lot of land, whatever apartment in Peter Cooper Village, Stuyvesant Town in New York City, right? We did all of those activities with the objective of actually improving the standard of life this time around, I mean, it was said most eloquently, and again, I, I tend to be sarcastic in my use of words, but, you know, it was said very eloquently by Hugh Pill that, you know, we just have to accept we're poorer. I think that's just a terrible statement. It's completely absurd. We're not poor. We're choosing to be poor. So I'm just curious, um, some people might point to something like the Inflation Reduction Act, right, which has a lot of infrastructure spending and, hey, we're going to, you know, electrify the transportation grid and all that. And they might say, OK, those are sort of big public works projects that are putting people back to work and investing in the future of this, this country. You don't necessarily have to opine about that particular program, but I'm just curious, is it is it programs like that that you'd like to see? Or is there any, I'm just curious, you know, what do you think would be some important um pieces of the puzzle of the solution here that you'd like to see implemented? So I actually think that's a great example, unfortunately. Now, I may disagree with many aspects of the Inflation Reduction Act, but I actually do think that the importance of the Inflation Reduction Act are that it, well, it, it claimed to be about inflation reduction, and many people would point to it as a further expansion of the deficit and in, you know, a competition for resources with the private sector. All of that has occurred against the backdrop of inflation decelerating rapidly. Right. So now, while I disagree with the idea that we can move to a green economy and that the objective function of the economy should be to replace fossil fuels with what I consider to be largely inferior sources of energy. Right. But that dynamic is mobilizing resources and putting them to work. And candidly, it's not driving inflation higher. Right. This is exactly the Truman Doctrine in that context of we can actually direct resources, we can make industrial policy, we can accomplish objectives, right? While at the same time lowering inflation if we spend it in reasonable ways or at least not driving inflation higher. What I would like to see is I'd like to see much of the red tape removed around all sorts of activities 
to encourage the private sector to step in and do this. I have some involvement. I actually was on a call today with the guys at trueflation.com, which is a website I encourage people to check out because it's actually got a pretty good metric of real-time inflation. You know, we're now down firmly into the twos. The problem is that it's likely to, we're likely to see many aspects of inflation return because we haven't addressed things like housing. We haven't addressed many of the issues around those types of dynamics by saying, you know what, let's dramatically increase the quantity of housing that's available. Let's facilitate creating um, uh, an expansion of opportunities for young people to obtain education in a way that is not dissimilar to the GI Bill. And that doesn't mean dumping people into colleges. It means training programs that allow people to actually compete for the, the opportunities that exist within plumbing and learn to trade, yeah. Electrics, et cetera, right? We have the trade programming that we've devalued because we somehow assign value to a college degree instead of what a college degree is supposed to be about, which is obtaining skills for employment. All right. I mean, I, I, I highlight this all the time. We talk about using market-based measures, and then we, we, we use something as absurd as our current um, educational policy to strip all the signals from the educational system, right? It's completely, it should be viewed as clinically insane that you pay the same interest rate to attend college to get a degree in civil or electrical engineering where your job prospects are fantastic as you do to obtain a degree in French medieval literature where your job prospects are non-existent, right? Like that's what the market is actually there for. Private sector lenders should say, you know what? I'm more than happy to lend to people who want to go to MIT and get a degree in engineering, right? Those people are great credits. You know who's not a great credit? The kid who goes to Bunker Hill College and wants to become a psychologist, right? It's just not a good investment. I'm sorry, it's not. Right. But that sort of thing is facilitated by the private market. It's facilitated by actual market economies. What we have today is a, is, is a pale imitation of that. OK, um, got a couple of things. First off, I just want to note for users here, um, one of the people who I've been reaching out to for a couple of years to come on this program so far with no success, but is Mike Rowe. Um, and Mike, I, I imagine you would probably uh, find a lot of his thoughts on the education system and the importance of the trades and whatnot, um, very similar to yours. Um, okay. And it sounds like, you know, what you're saying is, is, uh, you know, you'd like to see the government kind of, um, instigate some of these, these big works, but, but really instigate them and then create the opportunity for private capital to come in and, and, and really create a market driven solution behind these, these major, uh, movements. Yeah, I mean, that, that unfortunately is the great irony of where we are today. And it's part of the reason why I highlight, if you read my work, I tend to highlight the cyclical aspect of it. I talk about a changing relationship with government or a changing role for government. You know, we react violently or angrily when the government, you know, when people hear the government say, well, we have to regulate Google or Twitter, right? As if somehow or another, we, they were not regulated to begin with, right? The internet was very clearly regulated. They were protected given a walled off garden under Section 230, for example, that allowed them to develop many of the capabilities that they have today, we're seeing all sorts of behavior that would have traditionally been classified as antitrust behavior, right? Um, price monopolistic type behavior that's occurring Absolutely. in this environment. And we're scared to death to regulate that. But at the same time, we're super excited about the idea of stepping in and destroying the market signals for human capital development, as I just articulated. All right. So the, the role of government is, is perversely captured in this, like we're terrified to do what we should be doing. And we're engaged in all sorts of Band-Aid applications that are preventing the actual signals that are coming through. So it's, it, you know, I, I, it, it sounds strange sometimes when you hear a chief strategist in an investment company or a portfolio manager talking about these dynamics, but I genuinely believe we are in a world that is much worse than it could be if we were to properly evaluate the, the implications of breaking up or restricting uh, from a competitive standpoint the behaviors of many of the larger institutions in our society and subsidizing and encouraging the development of competition and human capital. 
All right. Well, look, uh, if you uh, if this is all a prelude to the Mike Green 2024 uh, platform, uh, you got my vote. Well, I, I appreciate that very much, but I very much fall into the category of if nominated, I'm incapable of running or serving. So um, I, I appreciate it very much, but there are better people out there that, that um, hopefully I can offer some advice to. <laughs> okay. Actually, I do hope you get a chance to do that. And I, I know that your, your move has taken you a little bit closer to the halls of power. Maybe, maybe hopefully some of those folks start listening a little bit more. Um, all right, look, I got a bunch of topics here still. I'm going to start jettisoning some of them um, to be able to get to your market outlook. But before we get there, um, uh, you were talking about the maturity wall that the credit markets face uh, in 2024, 2025, which is, I mean, it's it's it's, it's a ways out. That's there. around the corner. Yeah. Well, it's, no, it's, actually, it's, it's, it's closer than it feels, but yeah. Um, but, but in terms of like, um, in terms of like a recession, and I'm not talking about whatever the current definition du jour is of a recession, but like in terms of the lived experience of, of the majority of the viewers of this channel, if you do think a notable recession is, is in the cards, um, what's your current expectation of that timing? Um, is it so I, potentially a year or two I, out or is this something I, I actually be feeling more? Yeah. So, so again, I think part of the challenge is the data measurement. So on some metrics, so if I look at gross domestic income as different from gross domestic product, we're already in a recession. Um, we are seeing the increase in unemployment and unemployment claims that are beginning to indicate that. I'll give another really simple example um, of why that can be really misleading, right? So in the state of California, the maximum benefit for filing for unemployment in any given experience is about $13,000, 26 weeks at about $500 maximum per week. If you're a Google engineer being fired, laid off from your median job of north of $200,000 in compensation, and you're then receiving six months of severance, you're not going to file for unemployment, even though you're technically eligible for it, in order to collect that $500 a week, right? Yep. You're going to continue to live off of um, your severance, and the odds are pretty good that you're going to get another job going from Google, at least in the initial waves, because many companies have struggled to find those employees. But you're also highly unlikely to step in and find a job that pays you in the same way that you were at Google, right? So sure, you know, I, I'm very clearly seeing this. I, I had a discussion with a young person who works at Amazon, right, and is making an extraordinary amount of money for for a 27 year old at Amazon is looking at, you know, moving out of Amazon into competing firms and discovering that none of them pay anywhere close to what he has been making, right? And most it's, of his- It's income, not like the housing market, you know, right? right. It, exactly, right? And so, you know, like they're trapped by the proverbial golden handcuffs into the Amazon employment. The Amazon compensation has been largely tied to stock price appreciation. And so it's not really cash income. Amazon has benefited from underpaying its workers once you properly adjust for those types of factors. You know, and so you kind of end, end, end up in this weird place where, you know, the job that you took, if you happen to go for go to work for Amazon in retail as compared to going to work for, you know, JW Nordstrom in retail. Your experience is radically different, even if you're a, a standard line employee, right? Not something that should really meaningfully determine the outcomes in your compensation, but it does and it has. And that has characterized our economy as those opportunities begin to disappear as people are forced to confront those realities. I think you're looking at a, a, a further deterioration or a, a sense that the system is breaking in a way that has felt camouflaged for some people in the past couple of years. Okay, so so just to re-ask the question again, um, for the the lived experience where people can look around and say, okay, yeah, my life's getting worse now, right? Either like my employer's laying off, or my home's just dropped thirty percent in its value, or my stock portfolio just crashed, or whatever. Um, uh, is that later this year? Do you think, or or does it not really kick off until? this maturity wall or some other event, you know, makes it happen in 04 or even 05? 
Well, I think the maturity wall is, is kind of the hard end of that, right? So it can happen before then for any number of reasons. Anytime someone asks you for a catalyst and somebody offers a definitive, well, this is the reason why, they're going to fall prey to, you know, over-specifying the reason why it occurs. What I would just emphasize is the conditions are in place for that to occur on any number of catalysts, whether it's the maturity wall in the leverage space, whether it's the deterioration of funding of unprofitable companies, which by definition spend more on their employees than they make in terms of their income, right? So yep. the loss of those is a net loss for employees, right? All of those are starting to go away. And whether that catalyst emerges next week or whether that catalyst emerges in a cumulative basis over the next two or three quarters, it feels very definitively that it is here. Got it. Okay. And uh, if I understand you correctly, um, you know, there are, there are failure points that could happen to really get the snowballing before the maturity wall hits. But if it hasn't hit by then, the maturity wall is going to be a pretty big domino to fall uh, that, that could, you know, really then make it happen. But, but exactly when it happens, we don't know. We'll be watching and tracking. You're welcome to come back in the program, Michael, anytime you see something that you want to wave a flag about. Whenever it happens, I assure you, I'll show up and say, see, I told you it was going to happen right then. Okay, good. <laughs> and I'll give you credit. Uh, do or not, no, but, right. I, I, but you've been very good about this. But, but I just want to underscore what I also hear you saying is that this is sort of an exponential decay that you're looking at, or what we'll call a negative feedback loop, which is that once shoes start dropping, that will increase the odds that additional shoes will start dropping, right? Absolutely correct, right? This is, you know, you, you can think about it, and, and I actually posted on Twitter, um, and we can pull it up, a chart in response. I forget who it was directly in response to, where they were saying, you know, the rates of hourly wages in real terms are starting to turn positive as inflation drops, right? And I posted, I'm like, ah, it's a little bit more complicated than that on my math. If I look at things like total personal income, those have been sharply negative when I look at it on a per worker basis. Um, we'll put the chart in so people can actually see this. But if you yep. take something like personal income, wages, um, and total compensation, and you look at it on a per worker basis, inflation adjusted, it's historically been one of the most stable series in history, right? And the reason why just mechanically is because most times when you talk about a recession, it's not that people are losing their, it's not that people are seeing their wages fall, it's that people end up losing their jobs. And so the wage number in aggregate falls to reflect the employment statistics. Mm -hmm. The unique thing that happened during the COVID dynamic was we saw um, income and wages explode on a per capita basis because the number of the amount of money people were receiving for not working rose dramatically, right? Mm -hmm. So you saw this series rise and it's been falling ever since, right? It's basically been a continuous decline. I think that has contributed to the general sense of malaise that by and large, everyone feels kind of terrible right now. It's just nobody really wants to put their hand up and say, oh, you know, my life is terrible, except for Bitcoiners and, um, you, know, you know, those who are basically disassociated from the system. We all kind of are like, well, you know, things aren't that bad, but they're worse than they were last year, right? I'm really unhappy versus where I was last year. Um, you see that very clearly in this type of data series. And, can, you know, can, can I ask you a question on that? Just, just to have you yeah. include this in, in your continued answer. Um, so you just took a cross-country trip. Um, I just had to fly a cross-country uh, a week or so ago. Better choice, yes. Um, and, uh, you know, I mean, this is anecdotal, but I, I hear other people say the same thing anecdotally, which is, look, I'm looking at all this sort of pretty grim macro data, but like the airports are still full, the restaurants are still full. Um, we are seeing that people are financing a lot of their their lifestyle increasingly on revolving credit, right? Um, so maybe they're just shifting to, you know, put it on plastic until they can't anymore. But I am curious because I, I, I agree with you about the data. But if I look around anecdotally yet, to your point, I, I don't see too many people visibly, at least sort of in my circles, and I'm obviously not representative of the whole country, seeing the type of a behavior change that, that you expect if people are feeling terrible. No, I, I, I think that's actually almost a perfect explanation of exactly what I just articulated, which is 
if I'm personally facing a reduction in my circumstances, but I look around and everything that I see tells me, you know, there's jobs wanted, you know, people are saying things are supposed to be really good. The restaurants are full. My friends are going out to eat. Well, I'm going to try to smooth my income shortfall by borrowing. I'm going to use credit cards. I'm going to put money onto revolving credit if that's the only credit that's available to me to maintain my lifestyle so that I get to behave like my friends behave, right? I'm not defending this behavior. I'm saying that this is normal social behavior. The flip side of that is when the animal spirits go in the opposite direction, people are suddenly forced to re, you know, to reevaluate that and say, wait a second, I just put on all this 30% interest rate revolving debt yeah. so that I could get pizza delivered by Domino's, right? What was I thinking? Right now, I have to spend all my time and money trying to pay back that 30%. There was a, and, and, and that's the hopeful interpretation of it, right? The more frightening interpretation of it, again, I'll give you a link to a tweet that I posted the other day where some probably 24 year old kid is, you know, speaking onto Instagram and highlighting, I think it was Instagram or no, it was TikTok. I'm sorry. It was TikTok. And just so you know, I put this clip up in my uh, weekly market recap that aired on Saturday, but, but continue talking about it. Well, so, so, so you have this kid who's like talking about the fact that he founded 10 businesses that he quote unquote doesn't care about, you know, took out credit cards and went and bought a hundred thousand dollar watch that he's going to sell for $80,000 and use that $80,000 to finance his lifestyle as he defaults on the credit card debt to the businesses because business credit card debt doesn't have recourse to the individual, right? Now, that's just idiocy, right? It's, it, you know, you're engaging in fraud and you're publicizing it. Right. But the really frightening thing, Adam, is, is that I think that we have actually gotten to a point of degraded financial knowledge that a lot of people in the younger generation actually want to believe that, mm -hmm. right? And, and by the way, I want to be very clear, like I'm not picking on millennials or Zoomers or anyone else in that construct. I'm actually picking on my generation and the generations that became, because we did a terrible job of educating our children. Well, I was going to say, you're explaining. picking on the education system here, yeah, which right. is, does a terrible job of teaching financial literacy, yeah. So... It, it, you know, but when you see things like that, as I, as I said at the time, like, please, God, tell me this is not the source of the surge in business formations that we're seeing in the data, but a part of it is, right? I mean, we're actually empirically seeing this, the, the um, business formation data that directly feeds into the employment data forecasts that are used under what's called the birth data, the birth death model by the BLS for its, its forecast of, of employment behavior or non-farm payrolls, to be more precise attempts to estimate new business formations from EIN applications, employee identification number applications, which is what this kid did when he went out and started a business that he then took credit cards out, right? We're seeing things like a surge in business applications because of ridiculous things like the um, government change in 1099 requirements where you used to be able to make up to $20,000 a year without having to file a 1099 for um, independent business earned income, that threshold fell to 600. Many people individually will remember that as their kids calling and saying, uh, by the way, if you're transferring money to be over Venmo, you know, you can't do $10,000 like you used to. Now you have to only give me a maximum of $600 or it becomes reportable. Or maybe you said that to your kids because you were aware of it. That's what's actually happening, but that's led to a surge of business formations as Uber drivers and OnlyFans creators and DoorDash delivery individuals are suddenly forced to form businesses that don't have employees, but paradoxically show up in areas like, you know, um, catering services or food services, not elsewhere classified that according to the BLS are high propensity to create job businesses. Right. So like all, all of this is feeding back into a situation in which like we just don't really have transparency in terms of what's happening. But there is no scenario on earth in which a surge in revolving credit debt for people buying, you know, uh, consumables, groceries and everything. Like, that's not good in an economy. That's ins like anyone who thinks that is good is insane. Um, so I. <laughs> I totally agree. And I, I wish I had more time to delve into this specifically with you. Um, because I think it's such a it's such a key topic right now. And I love the fact that you're just really putting your finger on it and saying, like, look, 
there's no way to spin this positively, right? <laughs> you know, it, is this is like burning, eating your seed corn, burning your furniture in the winter time to stay warm, right? Uh, it just does not have a good ending. Um, and, and to a certain extent, this is another, it's like a sister to the credit maturity wall that you were talking about earlier, which is yeah. consumers can only do this for a period of time. And then once they can't, right, where they either just can't take on any more debt because they, they won't be able to service their existing debts, or the creditors cut them off, their behavior, right? They're, they're trying to maintain a lifestyle. Their behavior then changes very abruptly once they hit that wall, right? So oh, it's another one of these sort of just approaching milestones that we can mathematically project out there. All right, um, love to keep talking to you on the macro side here, but since we're running short on time now, I do just want to get to the markets side of things. So you are a capital manager. I mean, you, you, you have very well-researched, um, perspectives here that you've been sharing with us, Michael, but you don't have the luxury of just having an opinion. You actually have to guide capital based upon, you know, how you see the future here. So given this market, given this macro outlook, which is not very rosy, how are you allocating capital right now? Well, the, I mean, unfortunately, the simple reality is, is that the Fed, by, by doing what I think is an error, has actually given us a gift, right? So, they have told us that risk-free for the next two years, you can earn four plus percent. Mm -hmm. I don't see any reason not to take advantage of that. Um, as I look beyond that, I get a little bit more nervous because I also think the bad choices that are being made are going to lead to political solutions that may reinforce dynamics around inflation, et cetera. And so I get less excited the further out the, the um, uh, 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 bond duration curve I go within our firm simplify we have focused on building tools that allow people to maximize those expressions for example so my largest allocation within my fund um, on a uh, you know on a risk weighted basis is actually to the two-year there's a lot of people who talk about the two-year and who highlight that it embeds you know if i look at the forward curve it embeds the idea that interest rates are five percent this year and then are going to be cut to give or take three and a half percent next year I think that's actually wrong. I think the right way to think about what is currently built into the rate curve is much more like the um, the interest rate is going to be five percent this year, and next year the Fed is forced to recognize and acknowledge its mistakes, and it's going to cut interest rates to one percent, for example, um, as the economy deteriorates sharply. That's not yet priced into the curve, right? But it's a much more accurate reading that the market is pricing in some probability of dramatic Fed cuts as compared to this idea that, like, the base case is they're going to cut two or three times over the next year. Okay. So uh, if that's the case, I'm just curious, would, would that not be an argument to be allocating some of the portfolio out on the long duration side of the curve to, to ride the appreciate the price appreciation of the longer duration bonds so you would pick up price appreciation on some of those bonds the flip side of that though is in the response are we going to see an expectation of higher inflation further out that means that the entire interest rate curve has reset higher so if you kind of mechanically think about what that looks like um and i i reference this directly like the easiest way to think about my forecast would be something like the one year rate is currently five and change. The two year rate should be, um, you know, the, two, the, the one year forward two year rate should be something like one percent. And then the four year forward two year rate should be something like five and a half. Right. That's going to be harder to price into the longer duration aspects. We'll see a curve steepening. Which, which from this level of inversion in twos, tens, around 90 basis points, um, biases me towards being at the front of the curve if I can do so in a vehicle that gives me more duration exposure. In other words, a levered twos expression. Okay. All right. So um, aside from the levered short end of the treasury curve, is there anything else right now that you're, you're well, either investing I, in so or looking I, at or, I, I or evaluations the, is too scary? Yeah, no. Uh, well, um, look, I think that there, there's been a lot of interesting commentary that's been written by individuals highlighting um, that the value universe is effectively bifurcated into really cheap and kind of cheap or actually historically kind of expensive. 
I think there's some deep value stuff that's kind of interesting where the cash flow characteristics are high enough that you're really not actually paying for much. I'm concerned about the terminal value on a lot of stuff, in particular around the commodity space. I think that people tend to underappreciate these large sec structural and secular changes that are happening on the demand side that are actually going to likely depress demand for commodities. In particular, I would point to the slowdown in the growth of Asia, particularly on a population basis. It's just hard to see a scenario in which the world experiences the decline in population pressures that it's likely to experience over the next 20 to 30 years. And that that sets the stage for an extraordinary increase in demand for commodities, unless, of course, you're talking about you know, a significant expansion of, of you know, the wars in, in Ukraine and to a lesser extent other areas around the world. If that, if that enters in, then you've got a whole different set of issues, one of them being, do you actually own anything in resources that are in, in uh, far distant places? Um, consistent with my arguments around credit, when you start talking about things that are really interesting to me, that whole levered universe which tends to fall into the value space. You don't often see a lot of, of leverage, at least in the traditional sense, associated with small and profitable growth companies. Um, that space, I think, is, is fantastically overvalued um, because I think it has this nonlinear characteristic of moving from largely profitable to deeply unprofitable in the current environment. Um, that means things like high yield CDS or IG CDS, if you can trade those, become really attractive potential investment vehicles purely for price speculation. Remember that most of these carry negatively. There are ways that can be modified through equity long short exposures, and we have those in some of our funds at Simplify as well. But those would be areas that I, like, I would in general be biasing people towards quality. I would in general be biasing people towards finding companies that have strong balance sheets and reasonably defensible business conditions, business uh, models that are likely to sustain in the next cycle. The obvious caveat to that is the potential for regulatory interference at the very top end, the Googles, Microsofts, et cetera, the world, I think are gonna come under a lot of pressure. And if um, you know my other work is, is it all hopeful the Black Rocks and Vanguards, et cetera, will come under that pressure as well, JP Morgan. You know, we need to think about ways to, to reduce the influence of monopolies and near monopolies on, on our economic system. Yeah, we didn't even get into really the cartel structure of uh, much of uh, our, our economy at this point in time. Um, we're going to have to leave that for, for the future. But I, I, I would love to actually do a deeper dive with you on that, Michael. I think you've got some great thinking there. Um, <clears throat> and um, uh, this may be a little bit of a self-serving question because on the way out of here, I'm going to remind folks of, of Wealthion's um, kind of perennial recommendation to be trying to navigate these markets with the help of a good professional financial advisor who understands all the macro issues that we've been talking about here. But um, uh, it, kind of what I took from your your parting comments there on what you're looking for is, um, you know, it, it's less, oh, these are the sectors that are going to do well uh, or poorly. Um, and it's more, it, it's being back to much more of an active uh, stock pickers game um, than it maybe perhaps has been for much of the past decade plus, right? Where you could just kind of buy the sector ETF and just let it ride and feel pretty good about it. And rising tides rose most boats. Um, is that an accurate factor now where you're really going to have to do a lot more homework to pick out the the pearls from the the chafe here, if I can mix my metaphors? I, I, I hope that's correct. Um, as you know, a lot of my work is focused around the dynamics of passive investing and how that has actually changed the experience that we all have in the investing world. And so I, 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 I'm hesitant to get too far in that direction. I often... Um, you know, I often remind people that the simple reality is passive investing continues to gain share that puts positive pressure on companies and securities that are influenced by investments in that. Um, I would encourage people to check out my Substack, which is Michael W. Uh, yes, I give a fig at Substack.com uh, or, or Michael W. Green at, at Yes, I give a fig. Go to my Twitter handle prof uh, prof plum ninety nine and and it's listed there, um, but you know that 
Uh, I've written a number of things that highlight the impact of investments going into sector ETFs or into passive indices, and that can have a disproportionate impact on securities. I gave a really simple example that I walked through in detail, where you look at a company like NVIDIA, which is now you know, a trillion dollar market cap company, with a trillion dollar market cap company, your expectation would be, well, let's say I put in a $10 million order. If I told you that that changed the price of NVIDIA by 0.08%, which is roughly my metric of how much that would impact the stock price of NVIDIA if you put it in an order of that size, your reaction to that would probably be like, well, that seems kind of reasonable, right? 0.08%, we're not talking all that much. And then you suddenly recognize, well, with a $10 million order, that means I'm actually adding almost a billion dollars of market cap to NVIDIA, right? So when you, when you enter into those types of distortions that occur in markets, I just want to be very cautious in saying like, you know, active management nirvana is around the corner because I don't actually think that's the case. But I do think that it gets harder going forward. And I really strongly encourage people to follow your advice and seek out professional management. And uh, most importantly, on the wealth management side, an advisor who can work with them to accurately identify what their needs, objectives, and wants are out of their portfolio and their investments. So it's, it, you know, I agree with part of the statement. I think it's going to be hard <laughs> going forward for people to achieve many of the objectives that they want. All right. Um, thank you for both such a great answer as well as kind of making my plug for me. Um, but uh, uh, I'm, I'm glad you also brought it up too, because that was one question I did want to ask you before we signed off on here, which is um, the the effects of the, the dynamics of increased passive investing um, and passive capital flows in today's market are, are most felt in those top fantastic seven or however you refer to those stocks, yeah. right? Um, that that they're basically so widely owned uh, across the market right now, across so many funds that, I mean, what is it? It's like almost 37, 38 cents of any, every dollar goes into the, that goes into the market is going into just those stocks alone. I think it's over 50% of any, any uh, dollar that goes into the NASDAQ is going into those stocks. Um, <clears throat> so they, um, they are now kind of the tail that's wagging the dog, although I shouldn't even call them the tail because they're, they represent so much of the market cap of the indices right now. Yeah. Um, do you expect that to uh, moderate or get contained or change anytime in the near future? Do you see any reason for that? Or do you just see it as, as something that's continuing to metastasize in size here? So it, it, it's unfortunately actually worse than what you're describing. So um, when you when you start talking about that degree of market concentration, recognize first that active managers almost by definition are prevented by the rules from investing in them in proportion to their market capitalization, right? So if I'm going to run a diversified fund, which allows me to market it to non-accredited investors, I am restricted by the 1940 um, Investment Company Act in terms of the degree of diversification that I have. Passive vehicles have been granted exceptions to that. If you look at the XLK ETF, for example, you know 50% of the assets are in two stocks. If I add in NVIDIA to those two stocks, I get 70% nearly of the index is now tied to three stocks, right? So the active management space just can't even begin to compete. The second component is because of the change in regulations. When you talk about the money flowing in, remember that more than 100 cents of every retirement dollar is now going into passive vehicles because active managers are being net redeemed. And so when you start talking about these numbers, you discover that like crazy amounts of money are flowing into those vehicle, those securities whereas the vast majority of companies are actually experiencing outflows from the retirement space. This is part of the reason why the Russell 2000 and more accurately the equal weighted Russell 2000, which is probably the best proxy for active management is actually struggling while the NASDAQ soars, right? Um, it, it's really hard to change those without changing the rules around it. And so, you know, the world's smallest violin is playing for asset managers like myself who have lived by any standard an extraordinary life. But the simple reality is, you know, we've taken a firm like Simplify, which launched in September of 2020. And over the last two and a half years, we've busted our butts 
to grow it into one of the top issuers of ETFs in, in the investment world. We're extraordinarily thrilled and pleased with the success that we've had. But as I like to, to note to our investors, you know, and by investors, I mean both our clients and our actual um, capital, you know, we've worked for two and a half years to grow by basically one day of Vanguard's inflows, right? Um, the, the system has to change or we're going to lose the system. It's the same thing I said about the government. If we don't reform our relationship with the government, we will lose our democracy. If we don't reform our relationship with the public equity markets and public debt markets, we will lose our capital formation capability. So it, okay. it's a super sobering message. I wish I didn't have to deliver it, but it's just not as simple as dollar cost averaging into index funds. That's not the way the market actually works. And um, in terms of any progress we're making towards those kind of reforms, I'm, I'm going to take from your tone and your body language that we're not very far into a, a reform process at this point. No, I, um, you know, I, I so I started speaking on these topics in in 2017. Uh, saw a sizable uh, breakthrough in 2018. Um, we've largely been unable to capitalize on that. And, you know, when I, I presented my work to the Bank of International Settlements, the IMF, the Federal Reserve, et cetera, all of them broadly agree with the work. The academic world is increasingly aligning itself behind the analysis that I've done on this stuff. And they have their own approaches to it that, that independently confirm my work. And unfortunately, the feedback feedback that you get is, well, this is all great, but until a crisis actually occurs, there's nothing we can do about it because the vanguards and black rocks of the world control the regulatory apparatus. They control the political environment in Washington, D.C. Um, I understand why that is. It's a tremendous narrative, right? Let's charge as little as possible for asset management fees. Let's let everyone participate, et cetera. Um, but the models themselves are wrong and the theories behind them are wrong. And as a result, we're effectively, you know, following a map of the earth that says, you know, it's shaped in this way. And it turns out we're about to go over the edge. Um, you know, I, again, I, I hate, I physically hate delivering these messages. You can actually see it in my body language. You know me well enough to know that I really, truly believe this. But, you know, we're, we're setting up for a very bad outcome. And all I'm trying to do is raise awareness so that when it occurs, we actually are able to reasonably sit down and say, how can we work? reform the system. All right. I just well, don't think look, we can change it until that occurs. Yeah. Um, well, one thing I want to give you strong kudos for is I think it was Winston Churchill who said, um, you know, when a crisis arrives, the solution set that's considered are the things that are already on the table. And yes. you're working hard to get some of these solutions on the table so that by the time the next crisis arises, somebody can say, okay, look, well, let's try this thing, right? Um, all right. Well, look, we'll have to leave it there, but thank you so much for, for just telling it to us straight. Um, and like I said, Michael, um, open invitation to come back on this channel anytime. Uh, but certainly when you see, uh, you know, a, a material step, uh, in any of the elements that we talked about on the macro side of things that, that, you know, influence your sense of timing or, or magnitude of, of, you know, how things are unfolding from here, you're welcome to come back in the program anytime to let our, our users know about that. Um, when we edit this, uh, I, I normally conclude by asking where should folks go to learn more about you and your work. You already shared your Substack and your Twitter accounts. And when we edit this, I will put up the links to those on the screen so folks know exactly where to go. Folks will also have hyperlinks in the description, description below this video, too. So you can go to them directly. Michael, any other places besides those two you, you direct folks? Uh, well, I mean, the great place to go is obviously to the Simplify website. We've got an extraordinary amount of resources for investors to help them understand some of these dynamics, as well as to understand the products that we offer. Um, and I encourage people to check that out. Okay, great. Um, I'll link to that as well. Put that up on the screen. And Michael, that, that's Simplify.us, right? For the folks that are listening yes. on, on a podcast? Yes, that's correct. Simplify.us. Okay, great. Um, all right. Well, look, um, uh, folks, Michael made the case for me, so I'll be super brief here. But um, for the reasons that I always say, and he said this time around, I uh, highly recommend that you navigate this increasingly complex and, and, and potentially risky environment that, that we've been talking about for the past hour plus, uh, following the 
the guidance and the input of a professional financial advisor who takes all of these macro issues that we talked about into consideration and then building a personalized portfolio plan for you based upon your needs, risks, goals, you know, risk tolerance, et cetera, right? Um, if you've, and then executes it for you uh, so that you can focus on your busy life, but keeps you well informed along the way. If you've got one who's doing that for you, great, stick with them. They're pretty rare. Um, if you don't, though, or you'd like a second opinion from one who does, consider scheduling a free consultation with one of the financial advisors that Wealthion endorses. To do that, just fill out the short form at Wealthion. Dot com. These consultations are totally free. They don't cost you anything. There's no commitment to work with these guys. It's just a public service that they offer to help as many people as possible position prudently today in advance of perhaps some of those shoes that Michael was warning about maybe dropping here in the future. Um, and if you'd like to see Michael come back on this program again soon, please cast your vote in support of that by hitting the like button and clicking on the red subscribe button below as well as that little bell icon right next to it. Michael, I just want to say it's always a pleasure talking to you. Always a fascinating conversation. Uh, you're clearly out there trying to do good both for your clients, but for the larger uh, world in general. Thank you for those efforts. And uh, like I said, doors always open for you to come back here on the program. Thank you very much, Adam. I appreciate it. All right. Thanks so much. And everybody else, thanks so much for watching.